Welcome back to the Dash Arts podcast, seeing the world through an artistic lens. I'm Josephine Burton. And I'm Rachel Head. <laughs> so we're kicking off with a whole new series. We are, we are. Uh, our new series is going to be on storytelling and how and why we tell certain stories. And this episode in particular is going to look at the sort of origins of storytelling through the lens of epic poetry and great epics. You know, this this whole journey was sort of inspired by our work with the Aeneid. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's completely fair. Which which in turn was completely inspired by my amazing encounter with Maruf, which is almost like five years ago that I met Maruf. He told me his extraordinary story of moving to Europe as a refugee. And the kind of the story sat with me for ages and I didn't have the form. I didn't know how to tell the story properly in a way that would would be universal and and then I remembered the story of the Aeneid and that epic oral story well it's not really oral as we'll probably talk about it was it's sort of in the spirit of oral poetry um, and that story suddenly became the way that I could tell Maruf's story but it not it isn't just about him it's about so many other refugees that timeless story of the refugee from Troy who comes to Europe. But then that has taken us off on a whole new journey to understand why we ha- are still obsessed with like oral epic poems that were written more than 2000 years ago. And where we are now today with storytelling, I think is really interesting. I've gone on a sort of a journey with this podcast of initially thinking that like storytelling in its original oral ancient form was a bit of a dead art, wasn't really around anymore. And I now know having talked to so many people and done the research that that's not true. It it still exists and there are still so many people interested in finding new ways to talk about epic poetry and keeping storytelling alive. Mm, I can't wait to hear I can't wait to hear about all your adventures. Do you have a favorite epic poem? Ooh, I think for me genuinely over the course of this episode I've gone from loving the Odyssey to thinking that maybe I only love the Odyssey because it's the one I've come into contact with the most in contemporary life. And actually, do I really just love Beowulf? Because that's the one that I've chosen to read for myself, whereas the Odyssey is something that I've come across constantly. So I don't know. I've had a bit of an existential crisis about it. <laughs> Sorry that we've disappointed one. I couldn't really answer that question other than saying I'd have to say the, I'd have to say the Aeneid. Only because I'm so in the thick of it. Like, you know, I'm, it's all, I'm living and breathing this show. I'm two months out from, from the production at premiering in, in London. So it's all I'm thinking about. But I reckon I quite also quite like it because it's quite a kind of meta epic poem. Like it's quite a self-conscious one. You know, it's sort of, it's written in the style of, they have a storyteller at the heart of it. who's like, who's written into the story as, a story, as an oral storyteller. But it's sort of, there's something about the layers on layers of that I kind of adore. Um, so I guess that's a sort of double answer. I mean, it, I can't really think of anything other than the Aeneid, but it's also pretty cool. I mean, it is, but I'm also going to ask you again in two months and we'll see whether you just felt like you're <laughs> hostage by it. And uh, and now you, you're like, oh, I do like other, I do like other epics. Uh, yeah, I might have just suddenly decided I'm just going to use find the shortest, <laughs> the shortest poem out, one that lasts everything, you know, like three, three, a couple of lines, a couple of people. <laughs> no journeys. No journeys. We don't need journeys. <laughs> so I'm going to jump straight in to our interview. Great. Very early on, actually, even before 2018, I met Maruf, who is the composer and my collaborator of On Dido's Bar. And he told me his story of his journey to Europe. I really wanted to tell that story of of of, of how it, how he how he travelled to Europe and what experience was like for him as a refugee, um, and for so many people during that time, particularly during during twenty eighteen, when we had such a significant refugee crisis, and um, from just from, from the kind of fallout from the ongoing fallout from Syria. And I think I spent a couple of years thinking about like, how do we, with Maruf, trying to think about what we were going to do. Were we going to create like a big super band of musicians? How did we tell a story that was his story, but was more universal and had the potential to reach kind of even more audiences? And it was during the summer of 2019 that I 
remembered the epic poem of of the um, Aeneid and sort of had a kind of eureka moment going, that is how we tell Maru's story. We tell this, we tell his story through this this prism of um, through the through the epic story of this Trojan hero Aeneas who makes their way to Europe, um, and who is himself a refugee, but also the kind of foundational hero of of, of Western Europe. The Aeneid is a kind of classic epic story and epic poem, and I was thinking, well, one of the things that I love about like the epic poem is that they can be found across languages and across countries, and you know, like the Aeneid is one of many. And there, you start googling epic epic poems, and then there's the Gilgamesh, which I think is like the oldest one, which is Iraqi, and then there's the Mahabharata and the Shahnameh, which is Persian, and then they're like every you know, the Georgians have them, the Armenians, the Finns, like they all have their epic poems, and I sort of love its sort of universality. Uh, and they they all have. I mean, again, I'm totally like cod's history. I hope we go are going to get someone who could tell us about it in better, better detail than me but there's not like there's, there's not an enormous amount that links them other than the fact they're quite often quite long and uh, quite a lot of them involve trips to the underworld which is in the Aeneid uh, and um, quite a lot of them involve kind of you know, big epic battles and wars and journeys and kind of relationships of gods and men and heroes but the thing I was thinking about this morning was the thing that I've always loved about epic stories is the Oral, it's the fact that almost all of them have a history in oral storytelling, like before they were written down. And I think it's that element that I adore particularly. The Aeneid was written down as a poem um, by Virgil, but it, there's a sort of conscious telling of it, like as if, you know, Aeneas himself, the hero, tells the story as part of the Aeneid. And he sort of stands there in this sort of tradition of Greek storytelling that the oral stories, troubadours used to show up and they'd have their dinner together and then they'd all eat well. And then the, the troubadour would sort of stand there in the middle of, I guess, by the fire, sit there and everyone would gather and then they would tell these great long epics stories and from from what I remember when I was studying um, in Homer's the kind of Homeric vision of this troubadour he used to like he or she probably he sadly they used to kind of show up in town and they would they would do night after night after night of the telling of this poem and then you know for weeks on end and then they'd move to the next town and they'd do the next they'd do that story again all of these stories were eventually written down in you know in cuneiform in from the Gilgamesh and Greek or whatever it was but I was thinking the reason why I wonder if they're so good and they've stood the test of time is because they've been so heavily road tested it's just something about like the honing and the finessing in front of a live audience that, that had to happen by these troubadours and you know like maybe they tried out an ending and it didn't work with the audience and then the next time they did another one there's something about that audience engagement in the journey of the making of the art and the crafting of it which um, maybe makes them so effective and certainly I mean certainly the troubadours never wrote anything I mean maybe they maybe they did but the kind of gimmick is that it was all oral and that's why they were also they were written the, the poetry of the rhythm of the words were, were, were kind of happened in such a way that the poems the poets could remember them rather and then they were later written down so there's something about the ones that really worked and stuck in the best bits like that like the the best bits of the poem were preserved and written down and that i reckon is probably why they're so effective today and why we why these poems like the gilgamesh that's been written four thousand years ago or the aeneid that was two thousand years ago why they're sort of timeless and have resonance today is because they are so good that's amazing. I've never thought of that before. As you say, you, you get so much practice. You know what works and what don't. You're not just sat there writing something for, for people's private consumption. It's a, it's a public event when you perform it and boos and jeers and claps and cheers at every stage. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> I was quite pleased with that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so I, I, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't done it too. I mean, I think I came to it because I love it as a, I love the idea of a, the oral, the oral story being, story being like a powerful kind of communal experience that you all sat there and you all learnt, heard something together. But that, but then I was just thinking it through and thinking, but then there is something else that you get as an artist in the midst of that experience, which is, which is like incredibly help, important for the process. Well, that brings me on to actually, I know when you got, when you and Maruf were learning the Aeneid, you told me, and I'm going to totally put you on the spot with it. You told me that you, one of the um, exercises you did was, okay, now can you tell me the story of the Aeneid in five minutes? Can you tell me in one minute? Can you tell me in 30 seconds? And I was wondering if you would be up for telling the entire story of the Aeneid in one minute. And I will be timing you. <laughs> Great. 
Okay, Aeneas shows up shipwrecked on the co- coast of North Africa, completely abandoned, lost his friends. He finds himself in the in the in the kingdom of Carthage, meets Queen Dido. Um, she she welcomes him. Turns out his not everyone died. His sons there and a few other people. She asks him to tell the story of Troy. He tells the story of the fall of Troy and then his journey across the Mediterranean. Um, and then now he da- his dad died just before he was shipwrecked. They fall in love. They have this great romance, but then. Venus tells Aeneas that he's got to move on um, to Italy because that's not the end of the story. He leaves Dido, she dies. He goes to Rome, he goes down to the underworld, meets his dad who's already in the underworld, sees his future family, he comes out of the underworld, he shows up, discovers he has to fight a whole lot of people, including Turnus, in order to marry Lavinia that were given the keys to the kingdom of, of Italy. And that's the it. That's the end of the story. He kills Turnus at the end and becomes the king. <laughs> Is that it? Wow. I'm, wow, I'm under... I can't lot. <laughs> but it was under a minute. <laughs> you managed that in 55 seconds. God, well, I hope, I'm sure I missed out all the good bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that bit. And um, she's leaving and Dido dies. <laughs> I'm sure a bit sorry for her. The bit that I, the bit that I, that I didn't say, no, I can't play that game, but there's something about like why Aeneas kills Turnus at the end, which I, uh, I that would have, that would have been a detour that would have taken me well over a minute. That is interesting. Interesting. Is he told by the gods to do it? To kill Turnus? No, it, yeah. uh, it's, it's the completely fascinating end to the, to the whole story. I mean, it doesn't end with his wedding. It, you know, like you would imagine, right? He gets there, he kind of defeats the local boy who's going to take over the kingdom and marry the girl. He get, he defeats the boy and you sort of expect him to marry the girl and they have a wedding and they live happily ever after. But um, it ends with him killing Turnus and that's the last line of the poem. So we, we only know that he's going to marry the girl and live happily ever after ish because because his dad told us that halfway through and they went into the underworld and so people have always been again this is I mean, Shaddy's probably was better this when we spoke to Shaddy about this before, but people often say it, it's a sort of veiled attempt to, to undermine the Emperor Augustus politically by suggesting that that actually like Rome's a bad thing and Rome does evil things. And so this great hero Aeneas is a bad guy after all. And by and so that's an interesting way to end it. That like it's a slight dig at the Emperor Augustus by by the poet and Virgil. But um it's too complex for us to incorporate something like that in our in our version of Dido's Bar. So we've sort of we've definitely had a new one more complicated Aeneas in there who's, who's a, who has that sort of steel in him that might do something that violent but there is a little bit of the story which is kind of interesting which is that um, earlier on in the in the endless fights that happen at the end of the Aeneid Aeneas um, befriends a young boy called Pallas and promises to look after Pallas and Pallas um, ends up being killed by Turnus and w- w- what happens at the end of the, the Aeneid um, is just as Turnus is lying there like having just admitted defeat to Aeneas in the last few lines of the book and Turnus is begging for forgiveness and says you know like it's your kingdom just you know save me I'll go I'll, go, I'll leave your country and you you know you could be the king don't, don't kill me and he's really con- Aeneas is considering sparing him and then he sees um, around his, I don't know, around his neck or on his chest or something, a some sort of pendant that that, pa- that Pallas had worn that Turnus had taken from Pallas when he killed him, and it's the sight mm. of that pendant on on Turnus's chest that provokes Aeneas to kill him. It's a sort of flash of vengeance that does it, and we are taking that theme. We've done a version of the Pallas link in our version of the story to kind of explain why why Aeneas might kill Turnus at the end because he's the guy, he's the hero. What's the hero doing murdering someone at the end of the book yeah someone who's begging for mercy it's not really a good look is it no especially what we want from our more contemporary (laughs) heroes yeah yeah expect them to be better yeah i sort of love that i love i mean it's such a good point it's great that we've got such interesting nuanced characters to play with in our show that they're not all good and they're not all bad although Turnus is pretty darn horrible I, we, 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 I don't know how, it's quite hard to kind of create anything redemptive about him I'm looking forward to working on it with the actor who's playing him uh, is casting done? yes casting is done it's so exciting yeah we have a phenomenal cast it's kind of di- diverse and very multilingual and the brilliant person who was playing Dido uh, her, her family background is half Eritrean and half Nigerian and she really identifies with with the Berber uh, roots to Dido because um, she's got this sort of Berber heritage through her. I can't remember which side of her family the Eritrean is. So we will definitely be exploring that uh, that side to Dido, Dido's role with Lola, who is playing her. Well, I can't wait to speak to her. Sounds like she'll be somebody 
fascinating to to hear from like a mini profile on dido that she doesn't know she's going to be doing yet (laughs) (laughs) but yes she will now when it comes to epics we know some so much more than others i wanted this episode to discuss epic poems from all cultures and viewpoints the Shanameh May is a Persian epic by Fadawsi, and it was recommended to me by Iranian Kurdish musician Maruf Medigi, a name you might remember from several other podcast episodes and our inspiration behind Dido's Bar. But before asking Maruf about the oral traditions of the Shanameh, I went to esteemed theatre director Tim Supple, who first started working on translating Shaname into a theatre piece over 10 years ago. He was able to provide much needed context on the epic. First of all, it was written by one person and we know who he is. So it's not like Homer. It's not like the 1001 Nights. It's not like the Mahabharata. It's written by one man. He was called uh, Fedosi. Uh, he was a, uh, of course, Islamic um, poet who lived in what is now Iran. And he wrote it in the year 1000, uh, in, in, in the century 1000. It took him 30 years to write. He wrote it all in regular, not iambic, but um, longer than iambic. I, I, I can't remember what the technical term is, but it's written in regular verse, rhyming couplets, the whole fucking thing. And it is the longest poem written by an individual writer in known world history. So it's a poem written by one person, but it draws on enormous amount of sources so in that way it is a bit like homer or so on and as you as you referred to it has three distinct sections partly to do with how far back in history they go it basically tells the story of iran from the dawn of creation through to the arab invasion of 700 which was 300 years before, uh, or 720, so about 300 years before he was writing it, this guy. And the Arab invasion is, or the Arabic invasion, the the, the Islamic Arab invasion in, in around the year 700 is, is, is placed in the epic as the, as the end of Iran's glory days. But I'm sure you know this, Shana Maimin's Book of Kings, and it is essentially the Iranian story told through the prism of the story of the Iranian throne. So it's a bit like Shakespeare's history plays in that sense. But the three sections go like this, roughly, that you go back in history and it's essentially mythological. So the first section is what we would call myth. It, it, it deals in gods and demons and uh, m- uh, magical birds and people who live to be hundreds of years old and figures like Rostam, who's a bit starts in the epic, a bit like a Hercules figure, who's a semi-divine, powerful warrior. Um, so it deals very much in prehistory and mythological. Then there's a second section, which we would call a uh, legend, which roughly speaking, is a bit more like the Arthurian legends. It's got some very famous characters from Iranian history, but from too early in Iranian history for for things to be clear about them, like Zoroastra, like Alexander the Great comes in, like uh, uh, King Carbus, and again, Rostam, who who carries through this time. So this is more like legends, more like... um, great deeds, epic battles, romance, a lot of a lot more romance in that section, um, and um, kind of ethical struggles between families and within families and so on. And the third section is more like we would call chronicle and is a bit more like the Elizabethan plays about uh, history, you know, uh, there's sections in the third section that remind me very much of Marlowe, Edward the Second, of some of Shakespeare's more raw and bloody plays, um, that Roman plays, perhaps like Titus Andronicus and so on. Um, and 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 th- so the three sections kind of divide up roughly like that. And then another thing, just the last thing to mention, is that. It is also oh, spawned a whole performance art form, which I don't know whether this was mentioned to you, the Nakali. So the, nak- the Nakali are solo storytellers who 
exist only to tell stories of Shanime. And they are the major theatrical, there's two major theatrical forms that came out of the Iranian Persian world. And one is Nakali, which is this individual storytelling, which is like improvised verse, where they basically make it up and string it out, the stories, but they do it in verse. So they're not, they're not repeating parrot fashion, Fidausi, but if they do it properly, they have to do it in verse. And they do it with, just with a stick, and they're like a mixture of what we call clown, storyteller. Um, they're a very, very high folk art form and you'll find them all through that region they, they more or less have disappeared from iran itself but you'll find them in tajikistan in you know in afghanistan in um uzbekistan all the you know the persian exile and it's a, it's a bit like watching commedia de latte now you know what i mean it's a it's a little bit of a preserved art form rather than a living art form but it still exists so the shaname is one of those um core cultural expressions out of which came literature, language, national identity, storytelling, uh, painting. And it's an extraordinary piece of work. What an incredible introduction to it. Thank you very much. Did, I mean, forgive my ignorance, did Fidelsi create all of these stories from scratch or were they part of folk? No, they're totally part of folk. It, it's totally, absolutely, he didn't know. You, your, your ignorance is not ignorance. It's, it's I mean, exactly the same position. No, not at all. He collected in, you know, in every way, the Shaname is a bit like this and not mm. like that, and a bit like this and not like that. But I guess like Homer, it's all made up of existing yeah. legends. I mean, he, he might have invented this or invented that, but he didn't invent anything fundamentally. He, all the legendary stuff is legendary. All the myth stuff is myth that existed. All the historical stuff existed. Everything existed. But of course, like a brilliant artist, he has the poetic imagination. Like there's a section where the, near the end, which is one of my favorite moments, where, this, where, the, where, where the great Persian army in 720 are waiting in their golden pavilions. And he describes all the thousands of people on horseback, all the gold, all the grandeur, all the splendor. And they're waiting for these, this upstart ragtag Arab army to come. So the Arab army are coming and the Persians have said, OK, meet us at seven o'clock at dawn or whatever. And let's talk. Dust rises across the desert as one figure shuffles from where the Arab army are. And he's a little old man in a, in a, in a, in a rags and a stick and bare feet. And the, the, the Persians are laughing at him and, and he's saying, uh, we, will, we will spare you if you, on one condition, that you, that you uh, accept our God, right? You accept Muhammad is the prophet and you accept the one true God because, of course, the Iranians were multi-theocratic. And they laughed at him and said, you know, you're only like 3,000 soldiers or whatever. We're, we're going we're gonna to have you for breakfast. And then he describes these great soldiers in black with their faces covered on horseback, just slashing the Persian army down. So that event would have happened. That happening would have happened. It's not, it's, he didn't make it up. I'm sure it wasn't thousands against 3,000, but the odds were stacked against them. We know that Arab army cut a swathe from Persia right through to Spain in, a, in, a, in about a hundred years. But of course, like a brilliant storyteller, he, he mythologizes in, it, in his own particular way. So he does that all the way through with all the myths. So he wasn't, he wasn't creating content, but he was, it was a defining moment where his versions of the myths became the version. Well, and, and with his form as well, he was, Making it poetry. Yes, exactly. So I guess like all of those stories were collected oral tradition that was were written by various people come together and now we call it Homer. In a sort of similar but not similar, Shaname, were these stories sort of like common knowledge passed on orally and then he created the epic poem. It's just that we know it was him, whereas Homer isn't really Homer. Basically, yeah. And, and, and Mahabharata is a bit like Homer as well. We don't know, we don't know, we don't know. But we think there was one person, but we don't know if that one person ever really existed. Whereas this, we do, we do know that Fidelsi existed, and he did exactly as you said, yeah. With the Nakali 
who was telling them what stories to to perform? Was it out of popular demand? Were certain stories are more popular at different times? There definitely were top selling stories, you know, like the Romeo and Juliet's or the definitely the Romeo and Juliet's, the Macbeth's, the Midsummer Night's Dreams, whatever. Definitely. And and Sayavash and uh, Sohab and Isfandia, you know, there are names that come back again and again. Rostam's mm-hmm. a terribly popular character and so on. So Shanamay obviously has taken up a lot of your time and research. And I, I mean, I know you keep saying that you're not an expert, mm. but from where I'm standing, you're not far off. <laughs> well, yeah, I, ga- I gathered quite a lot of bits and pieces. Yeah, and what is it about Shanamay that appealed to you so much that, I mean, it was 10 years ago, wasn't it, so that you started work? Yeah, I mean, one thing is, this is my doorway into understanding the world, right? Through Shakespeare, through Shanamay, through the 1001 Nights, uh, even when I go uh, when I go to travel in like when we traveled in the former Soviet Union or when I traveled in, say, in India, um, even when I don't necessarily have a project, I'm I'm always going through the doorway of what theatre and what um, artists are doing, and especially through stories, especially through performed literature and through music and through um through the performed culture. That's my doorway of understanding. So Shahnameh was like a very beautiful doorway into a really remarkable mansion of a culture that I knew very little about and of a history uh, 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 that I knew very little about. So it was this sort of journey of understanding that was very interesting. But even then, what it even what, what what kept me really gripped was the way that it was constantly providing what for me is one of the essential qualities of great classical epic poetic drama is it was constantly providing stark and recognizable human dilemmas with impossible um outcomes and unlike some dramas it wasn't about how did that person get to that situation or even what can that person do to get out of that situation it was more about what will that person do given that that situation is unavoidable and will not let them go then what do they do what do you do if you're faced with your failure or what do you do if you're faced with your death or what do you do if you're faced with the the thing that cannot be altered it, it examines with a with a real flint like clarity and rather brutal um, uh, forceful focus what humans do in that situation um, the choices that they make in reaction to that. we did when we were doing the oxford contemporary music i came to came to your workshop with you that you that you ran on middle eastern music and the difference in the in the the instruments and you gave this incredible talk at the beginning and you had a whiteboard and you were drawing out and you, and you said the difference between the western and eastern sort of musical patterns is, is that you can see in Western music that it's a straight line and you have this beat and this beat and this beat and this beat. And then, and then in Eastern, you drew a circle and you said, here, here are the beats here, 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 but it, it goes round. It doesn't finish where you expect it to finish. And it really stayed with me. And I really thought about it when I was, when I was looking at these different types of narratives and these ways of storytelling, in some ways, the stories don't end in a way that, that we're used to stories just finishing there being a a definitive end and we understand why we've come to that end you don't necessarily have that in eastern storytelling yeah yeah and uh you know the there's actually a a good example i i think there's something that i've been also thinking the let's let's put it in this way that you know why in general why humans or uh societies need stories or storytellings all human societies we know if it is the a western uh, western society or hunter gatherer society they all have stories you know there's always stories and storytellers the role of stories cross culturally appears to be way of uh, incorporating cultural norms and lessons and helping people work out what they need to do or you know and what or how 
the things has done before. So, so storytelling is almost uh, is almost always dictated by adults to the children huh? to tell them, you know, the way of living. I, I think that this is not hundred percent true, but uh, you know, as Western children grows up, they are raised to see themselves as individuals in a culture of individualism. And this perception of the self in the world is unique. That is comes probably, you know, goes back to the ancient Greek. But uh, from the East, things are a bit different, you know. And uh, of course, if we're talking about China and Far East, probably there's more, more differences. But uh, the things is that uh, the Eastern cultures are not much emphasized on the individualism. So the heroes, the stories, as it is like the, the music. So it, in the East, they are full of uh, ornaments, details, small happenings, which cause, of course, we have this also in the, in the Western tales and Western storytellings or, tellings or epics, but they are, I think they are more straightforward, m- much more clear in sense. Than the Eastern stories. Eastern storytelling then is more about the the collective, whereas Western storytelling is is raising up one person. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the I, I think it's it's in in a way in a way that is that makes very much sense. I mean, it comes again until the nowadays. You know, nowadays uh, storytelling continues. You see the Hollywood Hollywood movies. You know, the Western movies is, uh, you know, we have still that the hero, the one who comes and saves everyone, the happy ending. So it's very much. And then if you look at the, the Eastern movies, you know, it's, it's not more about a person, the one who saves. So it's more, it's more layers onto it. And those re- layers are related to the people around and society around that he lives in or she lives in. Because we have this thing with Western storytelling where there's this, you know, I used to work as a script reader. One of the things you you always see in the beats of films is have they raised the hero up? Have they made the hero relatable enough that people can identify because everybody wants to be the hero, but also... Yes that it is aspirational still, it's inspiring. Whereas it sounds like Eastern storytelling is more of a true ensemble cast, if you will. I think so. I think the, 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 the Eastern story t- stories, they tend to have a large cast of characters that all reflect on the plot's drama in a way, you know. And in almost all cases, this cast of characters will have conflicting and uh, contradictionary takes on drama, but not necessarily they are, you know, the main. When, well, how did you first hear these stories, like Shanime? Are you told them as a child? Did you do you read them at some point? When did they come up? No, I think uh, for me, for me, on pro- and probably most of the people around me or is my age in Iran there was a, a oral oral story that you could hear either from family or from your mother or other kids they know a little bit you know stories so I think the one of very first one was Kuroglu so this Azerbaijani Turkish epic the story of this uh, Turkish hero who was I think he was or his father was a uh, yeah, his father was uh, blind, so Kuroglu means the son of blind. So I think that was one of the first ones that I remember. And of course, beside that, the stories of Shahname, which was always in the family, you could hear some, especially this uh, story of Rostam and Sorab, which is very famous. You could hear that in many different occasions, you know, in some uh, Yearly meetings that we had at families, you could have this, you know, because it's a story of the father and the son. I mean, it has the ending that the father kills his son because he doesn't know him. Some of other stories in Shanam, they were very familiar. Mm-hmm. They were the par- part of this oral s- stories, history, you know, which going on all the time. And uh, 
still, still, you can hear them, you know, from the people. And then later, I have heard a little bit of Gilgamesh and uh, and more of Shahnameh, mean, of course, as I grow up. And I learned to read, and people have read that and for me. So did your family, p- people just know the stories? They don't need to read them to you. They, they know them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All by heart. Uh, you know, there was no no book, as I remember, that they, you know, they read from. It's, it was all by heart. It's all oral, his, you know, stories. It's heart by heart going on. And uh, some of them are more famous, more known, like Shanawe or Kuruklu or Gilgamesh. And some less, you know, which they are tales from... One thousand and one night, or from other stories, you know, different tales that they say, and and usually the the one who tells the story has the freedom to make some change, you know. Hmm. So these stories usually change a little bit naturally, and uh, yeah, I think uh, sometimes I I tell these stories to my daughter, and I also take this freedom you know, to change some characters. And that's actually part of the, you know, the oral st- stories, you know, be, you you have this freedom to, I mean, the main characters usually stay the way they are, but you can add small stories. Like what you were saying earlier, these kind of stories, epic stories, they have a purpose, right? They're, they're teaching tools from adults to children in wrapped up in a, in, a, in a fable or a narrative. So when you make changes, especially when you talk to your daughters, are you changing anything for a purpose? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. It's uh, yeah, you know, it's usually a very, very uh, small details. I don't know what my parents thought at that time, but now that I'm telling the story myself to a smaller person, let's say, you know, I always try to relate it to the to the daily happenings. You know, if there was something happening in the day that I think. Okay, I try to say that the kids, they were listening to their parents. So I try to bring that into the story. That's a beauty f- also of this, these old stories. They have this ability that that's actually why they've been, you know, preserved for thousands of years or hundreds of years because they just, uh, it's, it's super simple stories about simple humans and the events are sometimes they might be as very big events, but you can, Put them in a very small, very simple details. They're amazing in the way that you can. It's maybe something about these old tales. You can really retold them every time a little bit in different way. nature of epics from all over the world got me thinking about the epics we know best and why we know them best. I can't remember when I was first introduced to the Iliad and the Odyssey, but they're certainly the epic poems I've come into contact with the most. Almost everyone will have read or seen an adaptation from James Joyce's Ulysses to Brad Pitt's Troy. It's been told and retold. Tejinder Singh is a scriptwriter working on an adaptation of the Odyssey run by Public Acts. I thought he might be able to tell me why we keep remaking these same two Homeric epics and about why some epics stand the test of time better than others. The project I'm working on is um, an adaptation of the Odyssey, and I'm going to be working on a section of it. This is an adaptation that is taking place across the country with numerous partners. Each one of these partners will be taking one episode each from the Odyssey uh, putting it on in a particular venue. So we've got the first episode, which is going to be taking place in Stoke-on-Trent, which is looking at the Lotus Eaters. And then the second episode, which I'm going to be working on in partnership with uh, Doncaster uh, Cast Theatre, is the Cyclops. The third episode uh, is Aeolus and the Four Winds at Trowbridge Town Hall in Wiltshire. And then the fourth one, Scylla and Charybdis and the Cattle of Helios, is going to be up in Sunderland. And then there will be a culminating fifth episode at the National Theatre, which will bring everything together and have representation from all these various community artists and, and, and partners. So that's all happening uh, over the course of this year and the next. Um, so you're going to be seeing lots of 
odyssey themed performances around england that's incredible so and the performance that culminating at the olivier is that another chapter as it were or, or is it yeah i mean it, it's uh, i don't want to spoil it too much each version of, of odysseus and the story is going to be slightly different as yeah. we move because there'll be different performers with different you know the the gender of odysseus is probably going to change over the course of this what should we call it Homerian pass the parcel <laughs> around the country. Um, and the final episode is going to be a sort of summary of Odysseus's journey to date and his journey back home, his, her, or their journey back home. It sounds spectacular, and especially because, like, that's the way that the Odyssey evolved or, or was told, or these, all of these epic poems told in different places and adapted slightly for each place they were going to. That is the fact. I think evolution is a really good a good way of, of looking at this text because we say it was written by Homer. We don't know if there was this one Homer figure. I think there were, there were multiple Homer figures. And then it wasn't kind of written down until probably, you know, a thousand years, if not more, yeah. After after the, the story, the stories first emerged, and probably then accreted these new stories as, as it went along. I'm working off the uh, the E. V. Rue version, which I think is the old Penguin Classics. I don't know if I'm wrong. I think it launched the old Penguin paperback classics. So mine is a, is a, I'm working off a really old school version. Yeah. And it's the book that I read when I was at school. So it's been a weird journey back into my past, which which is not like three thousand years old. It wasn't that long ago that I was at school. I think it's quite interesting kind of looking at it now because um, it's tempting to look at that translation as, as quite straight-laced, perhaps. Mm. But even then, I find it quite intriguing because there are – and I think this, this, this will pop up quite a bit – the Odyssey is wild. <laughs> it's 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 a text that um, I kind of find fascinating that it sort of became this curriculum text during the nineteenth century and was sort of fitted into this idea of a Western canon. Yeah, because there are so many ways that it doesn't quite fit that mold and, and you, you you know it requires a lot of um i don't know cognitive flexibility to make it straight laced that's a great phrase yeah um the, the canon of western literature when it was an oral text you know this english classic when it's ancient greek i know english kind of has its roots in, in, in a lot of greek but there's something there um it's not prim it's not very straight laced and victorian there is some there's violence there's sex all the way through it mm. and also that it's taking place on the kind of eastern edge of europe you know troy is in turkey ethiopia is mentioned and i think a lot of the source texts for it probably come from the middle east as well so 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 i find it this this fascinating text that is all all about travel and crossing borders uh I, I, and this kind of fluidity of, of stories and peoples in this kind of Mediterranean region. Um, and we, we probably are aware of the Odyssey because it had that kind of, it was, it was centralized as part of this Western canon in a way that other epics perhaps weren't. Um, but, you know, writers and audiences have responded to it, you know, ever since. There's been so many different versions of the Odyssey. Yeah, I think there's the version of the Odyssey in Space, Ulysses 61 or something. I remember that. A, a, a television adaptation when I was a kid. Uh, yeah, James Joyce. Kirk Douglas has played Odysseus, which I never knew. Uh, he played him as uh, Ulysses, you know, that other, the other the other version. But, um, you know, I, and I think the Coen brothers and things like that, 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 that it's, it's continually being reinvented. And the fact that an Odyssey, the Odyssey is part of, our lexicon, you know, we use it, you know, uh, even when we're not referring to Odysseus and Cyclops and stuff. There's probably some software engineer somewhere trying to find a pithy name for a bit of software, and they're going to reach into the Odyssey at some point and go, "Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to call this camera technology Cyclops." Of course they are. Of course yeah. they are. Could you briefly summarise the Odyssey for us? Yeah, the Odyssey tells the story of Odysseus, who's king of Ithaca. There is a there is an island of Ithaca now, which, but we don't necessarily know whether it's the same Ithaca that he uh, that he was king of. And it's about him returning home from ten years of war between the Greeks and the Trojans at Troy, which was won after he came up with this stratagem of the uh, of the Trojan horse. And it takes him ten years to get back 
during this period of the of the ten years, all his crew are killed, and at home his wife Penelope and son Telemachus have to contend with these unruly suitors um, who are camped in their home asking for uh, Penelope's hand in marriage. And basically, after much hardship, Odysseus returns and, and gets rid of the suitors quite brutally. I tried to kind of go semi-linear, but I realized I was going off in multiple directions. And, it, and, and that's what the, the story does as well. We, we start off with Odysseus uh, on the island of Calypso and then get a recap of how he got there. And it's a kind of sequel to the Iliad, which is about the, the the Trojan War, but then there are missing bits there as well. And the Iliad just focuses on one one part of the Trojan War. We don't even get the Trojan horse in the Iliad, and it's interesting. It, it it is like dropping into one of those not a multiverse, but one of those extended universes. You know, where you've got all. Uh, there's probably a reason why I've kind of said that because I'm thinking of like comic book hero universes where you've got storylines and different issues and different um, yeah different versions of characters existing all at the same time. There's a kind of odd similarity here in this kind of mythic <laughs> kind of collection of comics. No, um, mythical multiverse. Mythical multiverse. Yeah. So the Odyssey, I'd say more so than the Iliad is still so popular and and we brought it into our sort of western canon and it's and it's adapted so much like why do you think it's still such a popular epic and and arguably like one of the most well known of the old epics yeah as as i've mentioned there was that privileging of it in the canon that meant that it it was there for a bit but that wouldn't work i think if it didn't also appeal to people yeah um and i think that you know I, i made the connection to these worlds of Marvel Universe and things like that. And I think that, that that having this sort of extended realm to wander around with wander around in imaginatively is really appealing. I think that kind of sense of the wildness of it appeals to me. Having these deeply flawed heroes, <laughs> you know, really I, I, I think Odysseus makes so many mistakes oh my God. <laughs> during the course of the Odyssey. Um, so, you know, the sirens and, uh, and, and, and actually entering the cave itself. It's got these intensely dramatic moments and, and straddles. Yeah, I, I think it does straddle some genres. So, so for me, this feels like the Cyclops is, is this kind of horror episode that you've got a, you've got a monster. There's almost kind of a weird hillbilly horror about the, about the Cyclops, you know, a cannibal, you know, figure. And so I think that episodic element of it is really appealing because there's, there's like the extractable nature of those episodes means that I think people have, have continually kind of taken particular episodes to, to, to kind of, explore in particular even the ending the ending kind of feels it it's completely brutal but it's set up like a thriller in that there's this it or, or a heist because there is there is there are these suitors that are being dealt with mm. and and a plan is coming in place and then it's really, really brutal you know Kind of like a, you know, Sam Peckinpah would turn it into a horrendous gore fest, I think. But but it, it's clearly able to tap at those kind of that primal storytelling instinct. Yeah, the Iliad and the Odyssey are obviously and totally understandably lumped together so often. The Odyssey is like the sequel, but it's so much more popular. Could be because in the Iliad we're asked to support this strong, uncompromising warrior, which isn't as relatable now, maybe, as wily Odysseus who has to rely on his wits. What do you think? If, if I make an immediate comparison between this and the Iliad, the Iliad is much more populated, it feels. Although, I dare say, the, the actual number of characters is probably the same yeah. but it's it's very much condensed it feels it 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 it's it feels like we're in a we're in a war movie and uh, and and we're we're in a particular kind of moment and there are loads of things going on whereas there is a sort of um i hesitate to call it a, a more languid approach with the odyssey but i guess you know he does crisscross the whole mediterranean um, or, or maybe it's just that it sort of taps into that sense of the tall story you know, so you go, oh, and then this happened to him, and then that happened to him, and then this happened to him, which which makes it feel quite organic. Yeah. You know, look at looking at other 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 stories. I was thinking about um, 
Sinbad, who might have some parallels to Odysseus yeah. in that he's this kind of wily figure, who has these kind of parallels to Odysseus. They say, yeah, I say sailors, you know, Odysseus is a king who's a farmer who then um, ends up becoming a sailor and then is a, a, a soldier and then ends up becoming a kind of sailor by default. And Sinbad, it's been a long time since, since I've read stories, again, read stories that have been gathered from multiple sources. We call them, you know, Thousand One Nights Arabian. Arabian Nights, but actually a lot of the stories from beyond the Arab world, and but um, but Sinbad is this equal, equally charming, frustrating figure because he makes so many mistakes, and then he's not necessarily hugely noble by our kind of, shall we say, contemporary standards. I think there's one story where he goes to a <laughs> to a land where. He, I think he marries somebody, but the the, the ritual. To, if you if you become a widower, they, they, all widows are taken away and sort of encased in a cave somewhere and given some water and some bread, and they are left there to starve. And this is what happens to to Sinbad after he's he's been married. His wife passes away, and 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 that happens to him. And he gets out of it by basically when the next poor widower comes and is encased in this cave, he conks him over the head and ste steals his water and his bread, and, and then eventually manages to escape. And I think, wow, our hero. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, then there'll be people, you know, there's a way of thinking, well, he's very wily, very wily. I mean, we're having the same problem, well, we were having the same problem yeah. With, with Aeneas, um, yeah. you know, we're trying to adapt it so that he's the sort of hero of this tale, and he's uh, a migrant who's who's on his journey and trying to find his place. And actually, so much of it, you're just like this this guy. Everything he does throughout, you're like, how do we make this sympathetic? I think one of the things that is interesting about uh, Odysseus on the island of the Cyclops, I thought, was that the impetus behind the whole uh, of public acts, but I think particularly. The Odyssey as this kind of post-COVID affirmation of the power of theatre and community. You know, I, I think that, that that's been one of the key strands kind of running through this, that it's about communities and connecting people, which is challenging then when you've got one hero character. Yeah. So so what, what I wanted to do with his journey to, to this island, to the island of the Cyclops, is first of all, not make the crew collateral damage for them to have their own stories and their own, their own agency. But if the Cyclops represents, to me, kind of like a sociopathic self-entitlement, isolation and privilege, you know, the, 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 the rules of, of gods and humans are beyond the Cyclops. The Cyclops then also represents something that I think Odysseus could very easily become. You know that that there is there is you know, I, 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 it's it's really tricky having a central character who's a king it doesn't necessarily sit well with some of my democratic sensibilities, shall I say? Um, oh, and but but the great thing is that um, I think particularly with with the text that's been interpreted so much. That, that I feel like like we we have a certain amount of leeway to to change things, you know. I don't think the hardcore Homer heads are going to be writing lots of message boards saying, "No, nah, I think you'll find actually he's not, he's not like the you know." Or at least, well, uh, we're, actually, I, it'd be great if they did as well. It would bring about debate, but also, you know, we don't know what Homer, if there was such a such a person, originally wrote. We'll never yeah. know exactly. So to say, you know, that the reason that these epics still live and breathe in society is because we can adapt them, we can change them. Yeah, I think we should. With yours, how do you even go about taking something that is this oral epic story poem, designed to be spoken, designed to be performed, then taken from the page and made to to live again? How does that process work for you? So I've written a first draft, but that will change a lot. Recognizing that that text also needs to be flexible and respond to the community mm -hmm. as well. So, so I, I consider the text that I'm going to be writing as a template that is just the start of a, a process of discussion. You know, I was kind of writing it within a Yorkshire dialect that I'd grown up in. So, so that was a key thing that the Greeks are going home to. Yorkshire, basically, <laughs> rather than Ithaca. Um, that was a kind of a key element to it. The great joy of working in, in these kind of archetypal forms is you don't need to push very much for those inferences to arise. And there is something about the, I'm going to call it 
the directness of the epic mode that I really liked, which isn't to say that it means that you, you don't have subtext, but the, the way that these stories kind of do, even if they're really long, when characters kind of converse, they get to the point quite quickly. And this is a world where the gods and monsters exist. And, and I found that really, really appealing, actually. Um, yeah, Zeus is in this world. So there we go. Taj is working on a version of the Odyssey for modern audiences. He's trying to recapture the kind of magic that came from big public events where people would gather around to watch the same stories told in big, beautiful ways. In my research into how other contemporary artists were using epic poems in their work, I came across an article called Ancient Rhymes by Tristan Bernays, where he was asking the same questions. He asks, what if you combined the structural rules and the epic scale of the ancients with the wildly chaotic, free-flowing verse of the modern poet? Essentially, what if you used an ancient poem to explore the modern world? So Tristan uses these premises in his own writing and performing, and he created his own epic poem in a show called The Bread and the Beer, based on English folktales about John Barleycorn. One day, um, I decided to try and write a play. So I, I quit my full-time job working in a theatre and I started writing. And that was sort of the first time I went, oh, yeah, OK, I think I've got the thing I want to do. And I wanted to then look at the idea of doing a one-person show, which is a rite of passage for every hey, you said it. Uh, writer. <laughs> for every writer performer. I, I was interested in identity, but not my identity. Because, you know, who, who I am has been quite widely discussed in theatre for thousands of years. Like Alan Akebourne's got me and my background covered you know so like whereas i think now a lot of people are doing one person shows that explore lesser examined identities that have a real political weight and value to them um mine wasn't very interesting but i was interested in looking at this idea of something i was sort of discovering inside myself which was about the the two sides of the personality and, and this is all going to sound very wanky but i think it's young we talked about there are two sides to your personality, which are the Dionysian side and the Apollonian side. The Apollonian side being the kind of higher side of the self, the sort of rational, reasoned, upper, godlike personality. And then the Dionysian side being this kind of like grotty little monster that's like, I love drinking and booze and sex and gross and horrible. But you can't exist one without the other. They, they need to be in balance. If you are purely a creature of reason and ration, Apollonian, then you're very cold and you're very... Uh, godlike, distant from the experience of humanity. If you're just Dionysian, eventually you sort of look at yourself and you go, I'm just a grubby, filthy monster. And it's about the balance between those two things. And I think this piece came from a point in my life where I was interested in exploring those, those balances in myself personally. Didn't want to talk about myself because I'm not very interesting. So I wanted to use mythologies and ideas that I was fascinated by to, to explore those. And also kind of like concepts of like Britishness and, and, London, like I'm kind of London born and bred, I'm from the suburbs really, and was also look at, interested in looking at form. So the whole thing is that my show, The Bread and the Beer, is basically about this um, this ancient British god called John Barleycorn, who was, who was a pre-Christian, pre-Roman god we used to sort of worship. He was the god of, of beer, sex and chaos and mischief and mayhem and the idea was that he was kind of the personification of the barley, so he would grow as a, like a man as the barley grew, grew into a man. And then we would all cut him down, sacrifice him, quote unquote, and grind him up and turn him into bread and beer and get pissed and have a party. And that was a kind of yearly cycle. It was kind of very early kind of pre-Christian thing. But I was also really interested in the idea that those gods, I, I like the idea that gods echo through time. So uh, I'm an atheist. I went to church when I was younger, but I'm very interested in the idea how we use gods to talk about what we kind of need and how they sort of like how they're basically stories that reflect on each other. So for me, John Barleycorn was an interesting link between Bacchus and Christ, two gods who were embodiment of wine, you know, Bacchus, the God of wine, Christ, his blood is wine. Also we eat John Barleycorn in the form of bread and beer. We eat Christ in the form of the, you know, we drink his blood and we eat the bread of his body. The kind of, that either that's metaphorical, or literal, depending on whether you believe in transubstantiation. Um, and I was kind of interested in those ideas, but I was also interested in form. So the whole thing's an iambic pentameter. A lot of it came from, uh, it was two kind of main texts. One was the Iliad and the other one was Paradise Lost. Those are the two big kind of like texts I was looking at because one was like the classic epic and then one was the classic British epic. Um, 
so I think that's kind of where it came from. So it was a kind of on a personal level, it was about kind of looking at the two sides of the self, you know, like the idea that people contain the good side and the bad side. If we're looking at it in kind of moral value judgment ways, but both the sides are very important that you can't have one without the other. because otherwise you're just not a complete person, but also in a kind of form way, it was about looking at ancient forms of poetry to look at modern ideas. Um, and also at a practical level, I was like, I wanted to make something that was very affordable and doable because essentially I would start by doing it in pubs and in bars. I think the first time I ever did it was in a theater bar on a very practical level. I was like going back to ancient forms of theater. People would just rock up in bars and tell stories. And that's how theater kind of started. Fascinating. And also so relevant to sort of like what we're looking at, which is why the, the, the continued fascination with like epic poems and their, the mm. fact that they were something that was just told that, you know, and how we sort of use that now and, w- and what that means to us now, I guess the old traditions of it, it being something that was told that was spoken oral tradition is now transformed to sort of spoken word poetry. Weirdly, that's where I started doing bits of this. So before it became a story about a God, it became a sort of epic poem dedicated to London. So like, as I understand it, epic poetry usually opens with an apostrophe in a sense of an, an evocation of the muse and the story, the theme, the place, the location. So mine started like that. I remember going to an open poetry night at um, the Perch Cafe in Covent Garden. It was the first time I ever did anything like that. And you put your name in a hat. And there was like 40 people, some very good poets, some absolutely reprehensible poetry in there. I remember hearing a poem about Godzilla that I will never forget, even though I've tried many times too. But eventually, I think about three quarters of the way through, I was called up and I did mine fairly breathlessly. Like, ah, sort of squeezed it out but basically there's a very clear tradition from performance poetry people like bards in the kind of western tradition or griots in the kind of as i understand in the african or west african tradition you know and i'm sure there's similar kind of cultures where everyone has their version of like a spoken word poet who essentially tells stories and i think the reason they sort of stick around is because i re- remember reading the iliad for the first time i was like this is amazing it's like an action movie there's like sex and death and killing and explosions and gods and monsters and it's like why no wonder that story's sticks around. I'm, I'm actually, I've got like a couple of the old our epics on my bookshelf. So I've got the Ramayana I need to read and I've read like Gilgamesh and I've got some of the sort of other ones and I'm kind of working my way through comparing how they read because obviously the translations will be told through a Western lens and that might sort of change the sort of nature of it. So the problem is that you're kind of inevitably going to get a Western, but your own countries or own languages kind of way on it because the way your language functions. Well, actually. translation bias as well. Like it's so much more subjective yeah. than then people give it credit for translation. Of course. Well, essentially, you're writing a story from scratch, you know, and that's not unfair at all. Like, how else are you going to do it? There's no way to do it. One of my favourite translations of the, of the Odyssey is... Um, oh, is this quite a recent one? Yeah, yeah. I want to say Emily Emily Wilson. Is this the first woman yeah. to do a major translation? No, the first woman who's translated it, published it in um, the Odyssey in English. The first woman to do it. Yeah. Think about how many translations there are of the Odyssey how we just accept the the use of like violent sexual language towards women in it. And that's not to say that it's not there mm. anymore, but there are lots of different ways to interpret several of yeah, yeah. violent rape. And, and, sh- and she does that. And she talks a lot about it throughout and it's a beautiful translation in its own right, but it's also so eye opening for people to read and, um, and understand that there isn't just one. I think it's, it's kind of like, in comic books, because I think comic books do have a huge connection to epic poetry and, and epics, even down to the characters. Like Thor is one of the biggest Marvel characters. You know, I'm not a big Marvel comic book person particularly, but I think they're interesting to look at because essentially they're kind of the new epics. But also you get these characters that just get reused, rehashed, replayed with, examined in different ways. They reflect the politics of the day. Someone like Captain America would obviously have been huge gung-ho in the 50s and is now very different you know it's a kind of like look at that and i think it's kind of the same when you read a translation of the odyssey you could read the odyssey 14 different ways and 14 different translators and each one will bring you just as much of a different element to that story as would a different writer of batman or a different writer of superman so do you have a favorite epic poem and then within that do you have a a favorite fable or or story or chapter yeah i i love paradise lost because i think paradise lost is kind of the british epic I think, arguably, you know, there's other ones that you could argue like the Canterbury Tales is, is kind of an epic sort of in a sense of it's like a long extended poem, but it's very kind of bawdy and domestic. And I don't think for me, it really hits what I would consider like an epic. 
I also love Paradise. I love Paradise Lost. I studied at school and I know it's very like, I think it's very interesting because obviously it's a Christian narrative, but I like the idea that someone went, what if we applied ancient forms of Greek storytelling to that story and see what we can play with? You know, Satan is this incredibly dynamic, cool character that's kind of really eye-opening and catching. It's also, I think, the classic thing of the book is, you know, there's 12 books, I think, within it, and only four of them are actually worth reading. You know, the rest of the kind of, there's lots of kind of like, oh, you're, you're, you're. Um, but I love that one. I think the thing is everyone kind of knows the story of Paradise Lost. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it's uh, it's kind of one, I think what's inter- what I like about it is it, it takes something we sort of, for the West at least, take for granted of like, oh yeah, Garden of Eden, good and evil, apples, Adam and Eve, naked people, suddenly they, they're scared of being naked and snakes in the garden, all that kind of jazz. And it, and it looks into the sort of, psychology of it like and there's brilliant speeches where satan argues about what whether what he's doing is right and it's a great line where he says better to lead in hell than serve in heaven which i think is such a great yeah. line for a villain it's such a good like you know i'd rather was it i'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees kind of thing i think it's such a good kind of like fuck you to the universe he's a great character he's such a good he's the best thing in the whole thing he's the main character i think this i think the thing about epics is they inherently have a religious quality about them as well and i i think there is something interesting and in, so i'm not like i said i'm an atheist i'm not a religious person but i like using religion and religious ideas to explore where we come from as people, because I think inevitably we t- religions come from an idea of telling a story of how we got here. And, you know, like the Bible is a great story. The second you try and base a system of governance on it, it becomes problematic it, to the point of cruelty. Um, I, a, f- a couple of years ago, I wrote uh, a series of monologues, intertwining monologues called Testament, which was basically taking lesser known uh, Bible characters and updating them to modern day America. Um, cause I was like, the, the Bible's a great book of stories. It's epic in its nature. It's rambly and shambly and it's got like gods and monsters, you know, it has literal monsters in it and stuff. You know, I think there is something about all these things that have a kind of epic, the, the epic also covers the religious and an exploration of where we come from. And I think that's why we kind of keep going back to it. I think maybe that's the difference between spoken word and the epic is that the spoken word tends to focus on the kind of experience of here and now, whereas the epic tends to sort of, is much more metaphysical. If that makes sense um which is why they're kind of timeless you know you look at like gilgamesh gilgamesh is a bonkers story it's just like it's just so big it's just so huge you know? i mean i'm interested in where you got your story about john barlcorn from was it was that written? yeah originally I, I read about it in a sci-fi novel called pollen by uh jeff noon he's brilliant and he wrote this book called pollen about the pollen count reaching fatal levels um, and what you discover is that what this one of the sort of progenitors of this event is is this character called John Barleycorn, who is also a kind of cipher for Satan or the devil or whatever kind of anti god that you wish to kind of create. And I remember being like, "That's fascinating." This character who's kind of a British. I, I wanted to make a character or, or play with a character who was like utterly charming, very cool, and very enticing and interesting but very dangerous at the same time but you you have to go with that kind of thing i tell you what i completely forgot the other one that's really big in this beowulf i think that's also one of my faves as well because that's that's actually the british epic paradise lost isn't it's the modern british epic but beowulf is and i remember seeing benjamin bagby do beowulf in old english just with him sat on a chair and an old english harp and it was it was electric it was exactly what it felt but for me it was like that's what it must have felt like you know one and a half thousand years ago ago when they're doing it that sense of this guy rocking up, telling you this incredible story and then off and you kind of going, what just happened? You know, and, and the pure theatre of just someone talking to you. It's just like being told a story when you're a, a little kid. All these huge epics seem to somehow come back to the simple idea of storytelling be it bedtime stories, as Tristan says, or campfire ghost stories, we are still fascinated with how to tell each other old stories in new ways. Claire Murphy is a storyteller. She's also a teacher, a public speaker, a curator, and all-round excellent human. She creates new and incredible stories which blend myth and science to create something totally contemporary, which still has the feel and comfort of those ancient stories. 
I asked her to share her expertise with me on why we still just love being told a story. The thing is, we have been telling stories, you know, if the evolutionary biologists are right, then we've been telling stories for roughly 100,000 years. There's no proof, as in there's no written proof, because we've only been writing for less than 10,000 years, right? But if you look at, so Aboriginal Australians, the original Australians uh, have stories that go back at least 60,000 years. So that's my benchmark. If we've been telling stories that long, then our brains have evolved. The neural connections in our brains have evolved to make meaning out of the world through story. So story is is our original internet. It's our information highway. It's our it's our family. It's where we figure out things out, how we learn. So when you say like, why is oral storytelling still important? It's because it's always been there for us. Mm. So it's, it's, it's your brain lights up in a way that it doesn't when you're receiving information. And, and the, you know, I can go more into that, but there's this whole wonderful sort of fireworks that happen in your brain when you listen to a story versus if I just tell you some facts. Back in, in the times of ancient myth and, and the time of oral storytelling, and you, you know, you had the Nikali, you had bards, troubadours, you, you had people that would go from town to town and tell these stories, tell these epic poems. And I didn't realize that we had a version of that now. I thought maybe the closest we got were, were spoken word artists, but your job is to be a storyteller. Yeah. And it's, I love the way you say it in the times of ancient myth, because actually storytelling as a job, as far as I can tell from my research has always been there. So even today in places like Mali, although recent dictatorship means not so much, but the griots of West Africa would be considered a second only to the kings and queens. And the griots were story, are storytellers, but they are also history keepers and they, they keep the sort of lineage of families and stuff. So in each, in each tradition that I've come across, there is somebody whose job it is to be the storyteller. For some people, they get paid sort of by job you know the in in the irish tradition they'd have been called there was a couple of different names for them there were shanaki or scaly and shanaki were kind of these lore gatherers who go from village to village and they would you know if you saw them coming you, you know you get the fire going and you get the, get some dinner go and tell everybody they're coming and people would come to your house and it would become a visiting house and the guest storyteller would tell some stories, and but everybody else would participate and they'd be given their dinner and a bed or something like this. But then there'd be others who traveled around to the kings, to the chieftains, and sat at their tables. And so there is a modern equivalent. We're a we're not an enormous art form, but we are, I've come across it in every country I've been to. There has been a renaissance in many places in storytelling. In around 1980, it started in Brazil, Portugal, Sweden, America, Canada. It's weird that it started in so many places at the same time, independent of each other. Yeah, that is. So a bunch of people just went, why isn't there storytelling? Some of them were librarians, some of them were actors, some of them were artists. They all just turned towards it and it started to come back up. So it came up sort of as a folk art and now it straddles both worlds. So it's a folk art as in it's done in pubs and, and small places where, you know, might have really intimate gatherings and it's done on a, on a sort of high performance level, the way comedians do it and the way actors and uh, one, one person shows do it. So you have audiences in places that, you know, me and my friends have been to where you might have 5,000 people in your audience listening to a story. So you've got everything in between. So it's very much a job. So if anybody's listening and is going, oh, I didn't realize it is there. It exists in every country. You just Some countries are better, have a better developed storytelling scene than others. Can you share with us some of the techniques that go into making your shows? How are they different from theater or just or one person shows? So storytelling has a lot in common with theater, but also is in some ways fundamentally different. So storytelling was the, was the birth of theater. You know, that's where theatre sort of was born out of. You see in ancient Greece in the amphitheatres, there would have been one person standing and telling a story and then it developed. The difference is there's no fourth wall in storytelling. So we never uh, pretend the audience isn't there. We are always in active relationship to the audience. And this does something very interesting for the audience, which is we're not, we're not ignoring them, so they're not ignoring us. And when we start telling a story, that brain chemistry I was telling you about earlier when the storytelling is really good, <laughs> this is important. When? Then, yeah, because sometimes it's not. You know, there's, some, there's bad storytelling, good storytelling. But when the storytelling is really good, then the listener's brain 
the cinema of the mind is turned on. And what you get is a cascade of images going through your mind that you are making as I'm talking. And the reason why that's very different from theatre is because theatre, they construct the images often. There is one person shows where they don't, but often the stage is built. There are costumes, every, you know, all the artifice is made. But in storytelling, there's nothing, right? There's no added bits. So what we do is we rely on the space between us and the audience. And with our words and our work and the audience's brains, we make this world. And because the audience, so the audience is co-creating. This is what I find so exciting about it. The audience is making it while I'm talking and I can feel that and they can feel it, right? So they're experiencing their own imaginations and it becomes this intoxicating thing. So when they, when they finish, they've been somewhere else, they've time traveled, they've space traveled, they've gone into ancient Sumeria or wherever. And they've had a massive uh, experience with their own imagination. For some people, they say they haven't had that since they were five or six or seven or whenever they last did something creative. Their eyes are really wide. They're in a slight state of ecstasy because their brain has given them tons and tons of dopamine, tons of oxytocin, lots of serotonin. So they're high and they come up and they think it's they think that I did it. So they're like, thank you, thank you. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it was kind of both of us. And so fundamentally it's different. And when people ha so when people say to me, you're a storyteller and they look really confused, how do you make a living at that? It's usually people who haven't experienced it. People who have experienced it, they get that slightly wide-eyed state of, ah, oh, storytelling, I love storytelling. Because storytelling is a co-created, community, connecting, collaborative joyride, basically. And at the end of it, people are just one more, whether they're kids or adults. And that's just incredibly addictive. And that's why I keep doing it, because that happened the first time I told a story. I saw someone's face change in front of me. And I thought, that's a bit weird. What's happening? And then it happened again and again. And that's when I realized what I was looking at was a state of wonder. Mm. And the wonder is because of your imagination. Like, that's the amazing bit. So that's why storytelling is its own little, you know, bag. Where? Not little, but. And as far as how I make my shows, this is an enormous question. I will do my best to be succinct. So I have several different kinds of shows. I've got shows where I might do Irish mythology and I will read and read and read and read old Irish myth. I'll read loads of versions and then I'll be like, well, I want to, I really want to tell this piece of the saga. So you try and find where's the best place for that story to begin because they don't really have set beginnings unless you're going to talk for three days. And then, you know, where's a good conclusion that I can bring them to. And that's, that's kind of the work of an architect or composer, right? You're kind of, you're finding the rhythm of how everything goes together. And that's very joyful because I get to celebrate my ancient culture and share it with other people. That work involves walking a lot with the myth, spending a lot of time listening to the story, telling it, finding all of the ins and outs. The piece that you found, The Nine Muses of Queen's Crescent, is what I call a myth science show. So this is sort of like Claire's brain on stage. This is where I've, I've made two of these. I've one called Universe, which is quantum physics and mythology, and one which is Nine Muses, which is neuroscience, technology, and myth. Because I have this brain that just like, like your brain, I think, it just goes on all these directions and <laughs> sees all these connections between things. And it's really hard to make a show which expresses all of that. So it takes a long time. So both, both these shows took seven years of very slowly dreaming because I'm making other work at the yeah. same time and I'm out delivering and, you know, performing. And stuff. So with Nine Muses, it started with an article I read from the New York Times 14 years ago, probably is when it actually started. And it was around the idea of these people in India called Bhoppas who are saga tellers, so people you talked about a few minutes ago, and they're goat herders and they're illiterate. And yet they, they, every year they go to the desert and they tell a verse that's 12,000. They tell a story that's 12,000 verses long. So like an Indian scientist goes, how is that even possible? And he gets one of them and he teaches him how to read. Mm. And he promptly forgot the story. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So as he became literate, he lost the ancient myth from his brain. And that's what set me off on this massive journey. I ended up researching dementia, Alzheimer's, the blue light on mobile phones, the history of communication from the written word to the internet, myth, uh, memory, 
what we've forgotten writing versus orality all of these things are mashed up inside this show and then i had to work really hard to make it make sense so that someone who has no idea what a research can come in and experience a journey so it's a contemporary myth with lots of old bits of myth inside of it and old folk like it's an old english folktale there's a little bit from plato some neuroscience and then at the end you still want them to have that <gasps> that sense of wonder so that's that's the job and that's that's the latest show and we'll see what i make next but each each show as i'm sure you know as a creative each process has its own way and uh, my job is generally to to be quiet and listen so in a way you're adding to the mythological canon we all do all storytellers do they can't help i mean homer did you can't help it you're gonna and it's our job i think as storytellers to respect where the story has come from because it survived so long but also we have some work to do to make sure that our stories include people and we celebrate what's happening now you know what i mean rather than promote so the stories that, that are well known come from a very heteronormative white male lens and those are stories that got kept because those were the people in power and that's fine but if you dig under the surface there's lots of lots of stories that are really really old that celebrate everybody because really in some ways we're in service we are in service to society and we're in service to story at the same time so our work is to ask what is needed now and um, you know so this overload of hero stories what's the antidote to that this overload of heteronormative stories. What's the antidote to that? And as storytellers, we were asking that, a lot of us, a lot of people I spent time with were asking that before the pandemic. You know, how do we how do we support the changes that need to happen around climate change, around getting behavior change for climate change? There's a lot of storytellers who are dedicating their repertoire to telling stories around nature and, you know, raising awareness through the state of wonder to activate behavior change rather than here's a bunch of terrible news and you can't do anything about it. So story is this incredibly subversive agent for change. And a lot of us are, are very aware that we're in a position of power on stage and what you choose to say is going to have a really big impact. Claire's reflections on responsible storytelling felt like the perfect place to leave this podcast. I want to thank all of my speakers today, Josephine Burton, Tim Supple, Maruf Majidi, Tajinda Singhaya, Tim Berners and Claire Murphy. It's been such a pleasure putting this episode together and we'll be back with more storytelling and mythology for you next month. And for those who wanted to know more about the Shaname, we will also release the full interview with Tim Supple. In more Dash news, Dido's Bar will be touring across the UK this autumn. Please check the dates on our website, dasharts.org.uk for more info. I want to leave you with something a little different today, a story. Playing us out will be Claire Murphy telling us an Irish folk story from the Fiona Cool cycle of myth. I'm Rachel Head, thank you for listening. So long, long ago in Ireland, there were this group of men called the Fianna. The Fianna were these warriors, big, beautiful, burly men, but not just powerful and physical. They like they knew poetry and they had all these codes of honor with women and they were the defenders of Ireland. They defended Ireland against invaders, but they also protected Ireland from fighting against itself. And they would spend six months of the year living wild and six months of the year back at home. And when they were living wild, they'd, they'd hunt deer and they'd catch salmon. And this one night, they got the fire going and they were, they were cutting up the deer meat. And it was just one of those beautiful clear nights. And the men, one by one, began to sit down by the fire. And one of them started singing a song just humming away to himself, wasn't thinking. And when he finished singing, another warrior said, where'd you hear that song? And the warrior singing said, oh, uh, uh, I think I learned it from the bird in the field where we caught the deer. And the questioner said, do you think that's the most beautiful music in all the world? And the singer said, my voice? No, just, just, no, no. And the questioner said, right, what do you think it is then? What's the most beautiful music in all the world? And all the warriors sat around the fire. They just sat back because they could feel the power of the question. And they knew the questioner. He was a bit, he was, he was a good poet, you know, he had a great mind. So nobody answered in a hurry. And then one of them said, maybe the greatest music in all the world is the sound of the rain as it falls and hits the earth.
question. I said, that's good, that's good. Another one said, no, no, that's not it. Greatest music in all the world is the sound of the salmon as she jumps from the river and slaps her body against the water. And he said, oh, that's good, that's good. And another one said, that's not it. The greatest music in all the world is the sound of metal when we go into battle and there's blood and fury in the air. And all the men looked at him and he was covered in scars and they all went, oh, yeah. And the questioner said, oh, that's good. Another one said, no, that's not it. The greatest music in all the world is the sound of a woman when you've made her truly happy. And they all started laughing because they said, well, you'd know plenty about that. And so they began to throw answer after answer after answer. And it was the, the giggle of a child. It was the sound of the wind as it moves through the wheat. It was the roar of a fire. All these beautiful answers given as they sat and they ate and the stars wheeled overhead. And the questioner, whose name was Ushin, he looked around as the sun was coming up and all the men had answered but one. And it was the captain, Fionn McCool, captain of the Fianna, this man's father. And he said, Fionn McCool, what do you think is the best music in all the world? And the captain looked around and he said, all these answers are good answers, all these men are good men, but for me, the most beautiful music in all the world is the music.